Uh, my name is Roger Springman. I'm on the board of Sustainable Stoughton, and I welcome you to our second Green Thursday of the year. We did an earlier one in January on uh, CSAs, uh, which is Community Supported Agriculture, where we had three local farmers come in and uh, kind of go over or review the kind of things they grow for us. And of course, a lot of them, in fact, all of them, uh, you can buy into them with shares, so you get fresh vegetables and produce throughout the year. So it was a great program, a uh, very active uh, crowd that night. So we're glad to have you here tonight because this is even a more dynamic program because why? Uh, we have also a WSTO recording recorder here. And so this program will be recorded for playback throughout the community over the coming weeks. So if, uh, if you are at home and uh, want to get involved in questions, We'll make sure towards the end that you once again learn about our speakers and how to contact them through their, each of their organizations. So, again, welcome to our second uh, Sustainable Stoughton uh, Educational Program of the Year, the Ohio River, its health and future. So, with that said, I want to tell you just briefly about Sustainable Stoughton. We've been around here in Stoughton for about five years now, roughly. Uh, we began as just kind of an ad hoc group of people who care about sustainability, the way you bring economics, cultural and environmental things together to make the community a better, healthy place. And sooner, all right, which I should say, later than we thought, but better than we thought it could be, we said, let's do something different and let's get to become a 501c3. So we became a 501c3 a couple years ago, which means we're a community nonprofit organization. So we can host different things and we also then are tax deductible. For those of you that need that kind of extra perk in your taxes since they're not since they're coming up pretty quickly here next month uh, so with that said uh, we have the benefit of being a 501c3 so we can get involved in many diverse things uh, apply for grants and foundation benefits so we're glad we did it it took some work and regina hirsch to my left was a key instigator and helper to get that done so we thank her and I also want to take a moment now to uh, go over uh, kind of our board members briefly while we've got them together tonight. So we have a very small but active board, and we're always looking for more board members as well as just regular members. So we have four here tonight. You heard my name, and so Regina, why don't you introduce yourself? You already did. Um, I'm Regina, Regina. <laughs> I'm Regina Hirsch. Uh, Roger and I, as well as Ingrid, who's sitting on the front row where the original founders of Sustainable Stoughton. Ingrid has since left the board, but we've picked up other folks along the way, which has been fantastic. Um, most of you guys know me from the community. I'm on uh, the city council as well. We love anything sustainable with respect to parks and non-use of pesticides and uh, anything that has to do with green building design, you name it. And with what Roger said, we have um, sign-up sheets here, were you going to go over that? That we're always looking for volunteers, and so there's a number of things that if you're interested, you can volunteer for, like being on a board member, helping out with our Green Thursday events, like tonight. <coughs> we have a huge birthday expo, which will, I'm sure either Christy or Roger will go over shortly, that we'll need lots of volunteers. We have um, a farm to table dinner coming up that Christy will talk about shortly that will need volunteers. And then we also have, we take care of the pollinator garden at the Division Street Park, looking for gardeners and people that help us weed that throughout the summer as well. So there is a sign up, sign up sheet here. If you're, any of those interest you, or if you have other ideas, please let us know. Thank you. So another board member, Eric, do you want to stand up and just briefly introduce yourself? Sure, I don't have as much to say as you know or you. Um, I'm a recent new member on the board. I recognize some people, Ralph and just met Andy, Mushroom Lady. Um, and uh, I'm just glad to be doing this. It's a great group. Thank you. Christy. And you can also discuss the Earth Day Expo briefly if you'd like. Okay, I'll just kind of go over yeah. here then. Um, Microphone. And the floor. Uh, my name is Christy Pantoffer, um, and I'm also on the board of Sustainable Stoughton for just about two years now. I got here right before the um, first Earth Day Expo, so really got into all the advertising and publicity of it is what I do for a living. So I'm going to take a moment just to let you know about Earth Day Expo. 
It's the third annual. It is April 27th at the Lagarette at 515 East Main Street, the old tobacco warehouse. And it's from 10 to 5. And um, last year we had about 1,500 attendees, which grew from 500 the first year. So it's really growing into something big. And there will be um, food, artists, farmers, businesses, organizations, gardening, landscaping, everything to do with sustainability. Uh, presentations and workshops, live music. Um, it's really a lot of fun and there's something going on all day long. One thing new we're doing this year, which is of great interest and a lot of fun, is we are building a, a giant plastic monster eating the earth. So we're focusing this year on plastics pollution. Um, Sustainable Stoughton and board members are, are, are and the volunteers are right now building the framework and the earth is, just the earth, the smaller part of it is, is humongous. So we're inviting um, area kids to come at Earth Day Expo from 10 to 5 and bring their families um, plastic um, waste and attach it to this, to this monster. And then we will also have it in the Set and I Parade both Saturday and Sunday. So we're really excited about this. Um, and the kids will walk behind and hand out information about um, how to reduce their plastic waste in day-to-day -day life. So um, educate us and our kids. And the other thing is um, August 17th is our farm to table uh, dinner um, this year. And we're really excited about that because last year it followed Earth Day Expo and there was not a lot of produce at the time, but this year it's gonna be amazing. It'll also be at the Lagarette. We're gonna have lots of fresh vegetables and two different chefs. And uh, we hope to see you at both of these events. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. So, as you can tell, we're pretty active for a pretty modest group of people, so we're always looking for a few more bodies for help and assistance and volunteering. So, again, if you're interested or know people who could be, make sure that you visit with one of us or perhaps have them connect with us after the evening's program. So, with that said, let's get into our evening topic. You've heard uh, enough background, I think, to kind of get your appetite whetted for uh, what we'll be doing tonight from the posters. How many, just so we know, how many of you heard about uh, this program tonight through Facebook? Or saw it in some way through Facebook? Okay, we've got four, or five, six hands. How many saw it used to be a poster somewhere in town? Okay, a few hands. And how about in the article in the Hub? How many of you saw the article in the Hub? Okay, and those that didn't raise their hand yet, how else did you hear about it? Any other way? Friends, uh, gossip? Uh, this guy, okay, all right. Back your friends of Back to Street. Okay, great, yeah, we've been trying to reach out to all the different connections and people that care about water may have an interest in tonight's program. That's what we've got to make sure we try to connect with the Friends of the Bad Fish and other groups that have interest in water quality and water recreating, so that's why we did what we did. So tonight's program is the health and the future of the Ohio River. It's, three, it's a three-person panel. And the way we're going to do it is pretty much the way it appeared in the post. We're going to kind of look at the land, the broad landscape of the watershed first, and that'll be Amy's uh, role here, wherever. Amy, wait. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's the first time I've met her. I've, I've talked to her many times, but I have to think, okay, it's Amy. It is Amy. So Amy's to my left, and so Amy will have the first uh, kind of uh, 20 minutes or so going over the watershed issues and uh, talking about uh, the kind of programs and projects that they do uh, to make the watershed clean and safe and uh, also perhaps uh, mention other projects that they're uh, going to be doing as well. After that, uh, Luke Wynn from the uh, Clean Lake Alliance will be coming up talking about kind of the direct Yahara River activities that their organization gets into and batting up uh, in the, the final fourth spot or third spot will be uh, Susan Graham or Sue Graham. Uh, she's with the Wisconsin DNR and she'll be talking about invasive species, something we all have heard about many times over and sadly, they're still out there, and they want to come here, and we've got to keep them from getting here. So she'll be chatting about that topic. So with that said, I might just mention one more thing. The reason why we're doing this program is we all know that the Ohio River has been kind of the anchor of Stoughton for decades. It runs right through town. Uh, it, the river kind of divides the town in many different kinds of ways for different reasons. But over the years, it's typically been it's the sit to my canoe race that's been the real kind of attractive energy uh, input for the river use itself. 
Uh, some people canoe on it, some people kayak on it, but pretty much it's going to hit and miss for those sports. Now, the other thing you know is coming is the potential Whitewater Park, and uh, Dan uh, Glenn from the uh, Parks Department here, the City Parks Department is here, uh, to also perhaps as need be, be available for questions later, but the Whitewater Park and what it's going to do to the city and to bring both attention to the city and people on the river is kind of another reason why we thought, let's make sure people have the latest information on the river because it's going to become even more important in the future, uh, not just because of the Riverfront Redevelopment Project, but the Whitewater Park itself, that comes here. So we have a lot of reasons why we should care about the river in its health and future. So with that said, Amy, do you want to step up and uh, get us going with some background on what you do in the division? Sure. Let's say the park. Yeah, the good. All right. So um, my name is Amy Piaget. I'm the county conservationist here in Dane County. I manage our land conservation division, which is part of our land and water resources department. And we uh, primarily work with rural landowners and agricultural producers on conservation practices, habitat, farm practices, things like that. So I'm going to kind of give a big kind of overview of what we do, and then narrow it down a little bit to the Yahara watershed. Alright, so just kind of give you an overview, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the agricultural standards that we follow, how we implement them, how we do compliance, and then um, at the end we'll be a little bit about, like I said, the um, product. So as far as uh, standards, um, the way we implement programs uh, typically are from the state down to us, so they're delegated uh, authorities from the state to the county. So that would be something like the chapter NR151 under Wisconsin Administrative Codes. Those are uh, performance standards for both urban and agricultural areas. We, in my little world, just deal on the ag side. Uh, but we also have county ordinance as well. So right now we're kind of in a transition period. So the current county ordinance that regulates agriculture is uh, chapter 14 that also has language in there for our stormwater and erosion control management. Uh, we just went through a rulemaking process and a new ordinance, chapter 49, uh, was passed by county board earlier this month. We're still in March, right? <laughs> earlier this month and it'll be effective July 1. So uh, we've been making some changes there and those are our main uh, mechanisms as far as what standards people have to follow in the county. So when we talk about what are these agricultural performance standards, so any farm in the state, as well as the county, has to meet these. Um, one is basically an erosion standard. So if they have agricultural land, they have to maintain it to what we call T, which is a tolerable soil loss that's set by um, the, every soil type through NRCS is identified as having a tolerable soil loss. So they have to maintain their fields and agricultural practices or rotations to be at that value or less. There's what we call a tillage setback. That basically, sort of as, as it states, um, don't till in the long streams. So it's a setback. <laughs> Uh, it's not necessarily a buffer. They don't necessarily have to maintain any specific type of education, vegetation, but they just can't plow within a certain distance. We have what we call a phosphorus index, and that's going to be pretty important when we start talking about the Yahara watershed. Um, this is basically operating their cropland to meet certain uh, phosphorus runoff numbers. And it's tied very closely to erosion because a lot of phosphorus is attached to sediment. So those two kind of go hand in hand. Um, for operations that have livestock and choose to store their manure in storages, there are uh, conditions and requirements for those storages. Uh, process wastewater handling is something um, it's a little bit newer that we've been talking about that addresses things like milk house waste. What are they doing with milk house waste? Is it going to the road ditch? Are they collecting it? Uh, 
you might if you I don't know how many folks have been out on some of the larger farms or um, around the county they've got what we call feed storage areas or feed bunks um, where they're storing feed silage and that also can have some runoff issues and what we call leachate which can um, have some water quality impacts Clean water diversions is a pretty easy one. Basically, keep your clean water clean and keep your dirty water dirty. So that would be roof gutters. If they have a little lot next to the barn, if you put roof gutters up, divert that water away and uh, keep it clean. And then nutrient management. This one is addressing any nutrient or fertilizer applied to the cropland. So they have to account for that, manage it, and address um, any applications so they are related to crop production, basically. But it also has components that reduce risk of runoff. So there are setbacks to waterways or wetlands. There's timing considerations. So winter is one timing consideration. Is it going to rain? Those types of things. So this is a plan that they have that outlines how they're managing their profit. And it actually incorporates both the phosphorus index and the erosion. So those three actually become a package. So there's also prohibitions. Um, and these, when they were created with the agricultural community back in 2002, were all in agreement, basically, these are just common sense things that shouldn't happen. So one is don't let, if you have a manure storage, don't let it overflow. So that seems fairly self-explanatory. Um, if you decide to pile manure, we do have operations that have to stack it because maybe they don't have a storage or they have solid manure that doesn't really go into a pit. Um, don't put it in what we call a water quality management area, which is basically next to streams and wetlands that. Um, no runoff from feedlots or stored manure. So it's an example of a feedlot river. Um, <laughs> so not to have that direct conduit from where the animals are right into streams. And then no unlimited access of livestock to waters in the state. So um, historically there's been a lot where we have a low land where the pasture was, they let the animals run through it, through that low land is also maybe a stream corridor, and they've just let the animals go wherever they want. They beat up the banks of those streams, eat a lot of the vegetation, we get erosion, we get deposition into the stream, and so keeping those animals back. Not that they can't have access for drinking water, but just managing that so we still have vegetation and um, less erosion. Um, through our ordinance, we have permits, um, and these are the primary categories that we have as it relates to agriculture. So if somebody were to build a new manure storage in the county, they have to get a permit from us um, to build it, which means we review it, make sure it meets standards and specifications, and that they have a plan on how they're going to operate and maintain it through the life expectancy of that storage and have a nutrient management plan stating how they're going to manage the manure and nutrients that are in that storage on the landscape. Um, in addition, we have what we call our winter spreading permits. So uh, we're Wisconsin, we get winter. And <laughs> we have a lot of farms who still need access to their land in the winter. Um, we have a lot of small farms that have solid and that don't have storage. Um, so we, we need access to those fields. So these winter spreading permits identify the low risk areas on their land. So um, not steep slopes, not near streams. Trying to identify areas where we can minimize the risk of runoff occurring if something were to happen, but still allow them a place to go with it if they need to. And then finally, if they are constructing something, um, our erosion control and stormwater um, requirements for the county also apply to them for managing that. So those would be very similar to what municipalities or a subdivision going in have to be. Also have to do that. 
so from our standpoint, we, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, there's state standards. I uh, identified all those standards, the tillage setback, all of those things. Under state law, we're required to offer cost sharing for compliance. So that is one of the roles our office does, is we receive funding either from the county or the state, but we work with the federal government to get funds to assist landowners to be in compliance with those requirements. Um, all of the permits are submitted, reviewed, and approved by us, but we really rely heavily on voluntary participation. So having landowners come in and voluntarily do the right thing. And a vast majority of the folks we work with are in that category. Most people want to do the right thing. Maybe they just don't know how or what exactly needs to happen, and that's where we come in. We do a lot of what we call conservation planning, so looking at their farm, looking at their land, and giving them ideas on what they could do to meet tolerable soil loss or um, address manure management or various things. And then, depending on the route they want to go, we can also assist with <laughs> surveying and designing practices to put in that meet standards. And then after that, we can also assist them with the bidding process if they want assistance with finding a contractor. We do all the um, construction oversight to make sure that it is installed according to those plans. Uh, and then we continue on after that to you know help verify that those practices continue to be maintained properly. Um, so this, it's a lot all wrapped up into this, and most of the folks that we work with actually fall under this voluntary participation. Um, you know, especially if you think of the rains that we had last August, when we had that 10 to 15 inches, we have a lot of farms on that western side of the county that have huge gully erosion coming through, and that's just, they can't even, you know, can't even drive a tractor through some of that. So, that you know, they've come to us for assistance on how to work through some of that. We work quite a bit with a lot of state and federal programs. Um, farmland preservation program is one of the areas. This is a tax credit for anybody who has land that's zoned agriculture. Um, and in our county, we have over 1,200 participants, which is the highest participation rate in the state. So there's a lot of work associated with that, but that's also a voluntary program. So those people are voluntarily entering that program and complying with the standards and requirements in order to get a credit on their taxes. Um, we receive money from both DNR and DACAP that help us with staffing, um, funding to provide landowners for what we call structural practices. That's really anything that needs an engineering design or concrete. And then also for nutrient management. And then we work quite a bit with our federal partners. That would be something like the Natural Resource Conservation Service or Farm Service Agency on some of their conservation programs as well, if anybody's heard of the Conservation Reserve Program, CREP, or CRP, uh, which are set aside um, programs for land in natural habitat. So those are some of the things that we assist with. So CRP is federal, and what, the one on top is state? Are those two separate things? Yep. This is a state program that is administered by the counties, but it's the, the tax credit comes from the state, and obviously it's Department of Revenue that the taxes, we don't see the tax side of it, but we do the compliance component of it for any standards. Yeah. Um, this program basically is funding down to the counties to do implementation work. Um, and in our county, we also receive a lot of county funding as well. Our county exec and county board are very um, interested in you know, conservation of the county, so we get a lot of support with that. And then these federal programs, we assist them, but they're they're a little different as well. So they sometimes have different goals or priorities than we do, but a lot of times we can overlap and partner. And we can at least assist a landowner in understanding, well, maybe this program is better for you than this one. 
So just being knowledgeable in that helps us work with folks. So when we start getting into kind of the Yahara area and what we're doing, we have a lot of stuff that the county is focusing on um, in the Yahara watershed. So we have a cost share program that we call our Yahara Clean Fund. Um, it is tied to what we call our Yahara Clean Report. In 2010 or so, uh, the county, the city, DNR, DACAP got together and wrote kind of a big watershed plan for the whole Yahara, thinking about where do we need to go to help improve the lakes and stream quality in this watershed. Um, Clean Lakes Alliance has also picked up on a lot of that stuff and has uh, targeted some of the areas within that plan. And then uh, the county on our end, we have this funding that allows us to go out and try to work um, with landowners kind of at a faster pace because if we relied strictly on our state funding, um, it would take us a really long time. So the county has made that a priority. Uh, and within that, the first picture that I had up, that very beginning <coughs> cover slide, uh, one of our programs is what we call low disturbance manure ejection. So that very first picture back at the beginning was a low disturbance manure ejector. Basically what that does is ejects the manure and fall into the ground, but doesn't cause a lot of tillage. So we're not turning up the soil, we're able to leave a lot of residue, which going into winter um, protects that soil so that in spring it doesn't uh, run off, um, keeps the sediment where it's be. And then we also have a program called Harvestable Buffers. That is a program where we uh, basically cost share a buffer, and then the width of that buffer can vary depending on the farmer's needs, the equipment, our needs. And it gets set aside for 15 years. So we pay a rate for 15 years to set aside that land and it follows along stream corridors. It's similar to the state's CREP program, but it's also different because we call it harvestable. So for a farm that maybe still needs to get hay, they can still cut it and collect that for hay. So we're not taking it completely out of production for them, but we're just saying it has to be maintained and permanent cover. Um, there's a very large uh, project going on same watershed called Yahara Winds. Anybody's heard of that one? I believe Stoughton is a participant in Yahara Winds. Um, that is what we call an adaptive management project, which is a state program that allows wastewater treatment plants uh, the alternative to work and partner with farmers and other entities to do conservation on the land and address phosphorus in those areas as opposed to doing a plant upgrade. Um, and that's, there's usually a cost analysis there, so plant upgrade may cost you know, $100 million to, to move their, their thermometer very, very little, where working out in the watershed you can get a lot more effort done and probably a lot more benefit to the whole watershed. So we have this, it's a partnership with pretty much all of the municipalities around the lakes. Uh, the county is contracted to help producers get practices in place for this project. Um, and then finally, you may or may not have heard some of the innovative stuff, whether it's in the news, uh, legacy sediment. Um, is, is uh, big coin suck the muck, so if you've heard that. <laughs> um, this is where we're looking at some of these low flow streams throughout the watershed. The first one was up in Dorn Creek, up in the northern part of the watershed that drains into Mendota, um, where we did a bunch of research to try to figure out why, if we've done all of this conservation on the landscape, why is the water quality not changing? That's a watershed that has really high participation from all of the farmers. You know, they're going above and beyond, but the water quality wasn't changing. I mean, it wasn't getting worse, but it wasn't getting better. We couldn't figure out why. So working in partnership with Department of Natural Resources, 
we did a bunch of analysis and testing and found that in that stream corridor, there was over two feet of sediment. And when that was tested, it was very uh, high in phosphorus. And then when they further analyzed it, it was also releasing phosphorus into the water. And then when it was aged, we found out that some of that stuff was over 100 years old. So we call it legacy because it's not necessarily coming off the farm fields today. This is stuff through history that's just settled out into the system. So um, when you say suck them up, that's in essence what we're doing. We're out there taking that out. So Dorn Creek was the first area that was done. And there's other streams targeted around the watershed to address this. Uh, we have a number of what we call either community storage systems where there's a number of digesters that the county has helped support it, where we're working with farmers to bring the manure in to have it treated. And then we're looking at what we call alternative treatment technologies. Um, right now there's a facility being built that um, will basically take the effluent out of a digester and treat it such that I mean, if you wanted you could drink it at the end and then be able to discharge it to the stream. So removing the water out of manure is one of the big key things that a lot of farmers and producers say is a challenge uh, when they're hauling manure. It's very expensive to haul water, you know, when all they really want is the nutrient part of it. So how do we separate those two and get a good nutrient product that's easier to handle, easier to manage, less volume, and remove the water component of it. So those are all things the county's looking at as far as within the watershed uh, working towards. So when we talk about the watershed, this is the whole watershed that we're, we're talking about. Um, this, this map here is kind of showing where we have the highest loading phosphorus areas. So primary concern <coughs> right now is phosphorus because that's the limiting nutrient for these lakes. So that's what's generating <coughs> that's what's letting the plants grow, whether they're good plants or bad plants. Um, so these areas in brown are been modeled where the highest loading of phosphorus is coming from, and then you can see it kind of scales, <coughs> scales down. Um, and when we look at the analysis of this watershed, we have about 60% of it coming from agricultural rural areas, or I could also say we need natural areas, so we have a lot of wetland complexes, things like that. Wetlands are great sinks for phosphorus and nutrients and sediment. They also get to capacity, whatever that capacity is, we don't necessarily know. But at some point, they're also good uh, dischargers of that as well, so um, they can be sources as well as benefits. But then also about 40% of it comes from the urbanized areas, and we have a pretty heavily concentrated, you know, developed area right in and around those lakes. So it's a challenging issue when we think about that. <coughs> that was going to get into. Um, one of the things everybody always asks, well, what do you do if somebody doesn't want to play, play ball? Um, we have an enforcement process, that's what this is getting at. But again, our primary goal is education, outreach, and voluntary compliance. And we've gotten really far with that. But when we get into these challenges, um, you know, invasives are one thing. Sue may talk about some things, but some of the things directly impacting water quality, we've got what we call the sunny water flea in Mendota, which is the down <coughs> down, my understanding. And Daphne is what you want in your lake because it eats algae. So if we have something eating the bugs that are eating algae, we get more algae because we don't have as many. It messes up that whole natural cycle of the lake. We've had zebra mussels enter the system. What is that going to do for us? There could be other things. Um, weather. Weather's always a challenge, obviously, last year. <laughs> Um, showed us that, even this year, you know, this winter, you know, we had, what, almost two feet of snow melt in a day, plus rain on top of it, and it's still frozen, so all of that is a big challenge, how do we address that, you know, we could be making great strides on the landscape and then get a 10 inch rain, and what did that do for us? We don't, we don't really plan for those types of weather events because they're so extreme and they're really not supposed to happen all that often, they just seem to be happening often. And then a lot of our, you know, land use patterns. Um, 
especially around you know the center center of the county, we have a lot of land that's being converted from agriculture to development, you know, residential or commercial development, and that creates issues with fragmentation of land. It creates issues with a kind of a rural urban um, intersection where some people don't like that natural <coughs> side or some of the uh, offsets of that, you know, smells, things like that. It also just reduces our available agricultural land. And in Dane County, agriculture is our number one economic um, thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what, you know, that's that's what we generate all of, you know, that's our number one industry in this county. So it's important to our county and it's important to this county's heritage and history too. So um, that's, that's a challenge that that everybody kind of has to deal with, and, and how do we deal with that? What do we do there? Um, this one always gets me. Um, gotta go without the vehicle a little bit. Um, you know, there there are two things that interest him. You know, the relationship of people to each other and the relationship of people to land. And in our shop, what we always say is we work with the people, who work with the land, but. Uh, we, we start having these ongoing kind of jokes around the office that we all should have been sociologists and not conservationists because we spend a lot more time trying to talk people into doing things and uh, we have to know the conservation side of it but we really have to work with the people um, and everybody's unique. So that's what I've got. This is our contact so you can go on our website. Thank you, Amy. going to do for the uh, for more of the uh, intense questioning is kind of hold that to the end but if you have an urgent question you want to ask Amy now feel free to do so before we uh, have Luke come up so any urgent questions for Amy or if not we'll just uh, hold them till later then so okay uh, why don't we just oh we have a question back here go ahead oh, sorry uh, what, what are the main pho uh, the sources for the urban phosphorus on Pardon? What are the main sources for the urban phosphorus? Well? Urban side. Um, urban would be lawn fertilizers. Um, actually, leaves from trees in the fall. Those are some big ones. Um, kind of. Those are those are kind of the really big ones. You know, but we have other issues too with our sediment. You know, if you look at this winter, for example, uh, you know we used a lot of salt, but we also used a lot of sand. And all that sand runs off to the storm drains, and all those storm drains go directly to a water body. They don't go to treatment. They don't go to the wastewater plant. They go right to our lakes and streams. So all that stuff is a direct discharge into it. So, yeah. One more question. Right. So when you suck the muck, where where does that go? In the um, Dorn Creek project, uh, the landowners adjacent to that stream were both DNR and the county. And so we um, used sediment basins to allow the sediment to uh, settle out and then allow the water to go back into the stream. And then those sediment basins are going to get filled in and restored to prairie. So it's going to be basically captured in that and then Established as prairie, so it can't move. And all. Prairie plants will use it over time. Cool. What, what's the, what you're capturing there is phosphorus, right? Can you use that as a nutrient instead of just burying it in place? You could. We have a lot of phosphorus available based on the number of farms and things that we have. So, phosphorus, as far as a land. Um, nutrient, you know, a nutrient for growing crops or things like that isn't necessarily needed for us. Um, and at this point there isn't really a market and it gets very expensive to transport it. So it becomes kind of cost prohibitive to move that elsewhere. Unless there was a market. All right, well I think well thank you uh, for your questions and I think those are great questions. And we're gonna have I'm sure more after Luke's and then more after Susan's. So we're gonna have a great set of questions and answers coming up here shortly. So one of the things that uh, we're blessed with in the greater Madison area is having organizations dedicated to very specific and important tasks. And I'm really glad to say and proud to say that with the Clean Lakes Alliance, we have an organization, nonprofit, 
dedicated to our Madison Greater Watershed and the Yahara Watershed in specific. So, uh, Luke, it's a pleasure to have you here, and we'll let you take off and uh, explain all that you do and uh, all that you can accomplish. Fantastic. Thank yes. you. So, um, good evening, everyone. I'm Luke Wynn. Um, I'm happy to be here representing Great Lakes Alliance. Um, I'm going to be talking, uh, I'm going to compliment uh, Amy's talk nicely. I'm going to take a step back and talk a little bit about um, the, the main water quality issues that we're seeing in the Yohara Lakes. Um, we are a lakes organization, um, but we do recognize uh, the importance and interconnectedness of our water resources. Um, so th all of these things apply to the Yohara River um, throughout and throughout the entire watershed. Um, to give a little uh, background on myself, I um, was actually uh, born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. So. Um, Wisconsin has completely stolen my southern accent from me, but uh, the water resources in Memphis were a little different. We had the, the Mississippi River growing up, and to me that was just something that conveyed cargo ships down the river and up the river. Um, the water bodies that we had in the area were always small, uh, man-made lakes um, that I later learned were primarily detention ponds. Um, there were very few, you had to drive to, to get to a natural lake. Uh, so when I moved to Wisconsin to study water resources, um, I think what happened to me happens to a lot of people that visit the Yohara watershed. Um, the first thing you see is you know, Lake Mendota, and it's, you're drawn to the, uh, the beauty of it, and you're also drawn to um, how the community bands around it. You know, the community is drawn towards that near shore environment. You see people. Uh, sailing, kayaking, you see people fishing, um, and it's this bustling community that's really uh, centered around the lakes, and that really uh, gets to the heart of the Clean Lakes Alliance vision. We uh, foresee a future, or want to see a future, where everyone realizes that the lakes are the center of the community. Um, the um, state capital was selected to be in this area because of the lakes. Uh, a world, uh, world class research university is, is here because of the lakes. Um, we have so many amazing things in the city that uh, really do revolve around the lakes, and we believe that the lakes need to be held to the same standard as the other assets in our community. Um, we have nationally ranked bike paths that trans, uh, transverse the entire watershed. We have uh, one of the largest. Uh, producer-led farmers markets in the country. And so we have these tremendous assets and we want the lakes to be held to that same standard. Um, and we believe that healthy lakes really do equal a, a healthy community. Um, so we'll take a look at the watershed a little bit. You saw the map earlier. So um, the majority of the watershed is obviously rural area, We're talking about agricultural land, livestock land, um, and even wetlands that Amy mentioned. Um, and then we have, uh, the rest of it is the urban environment. And the urban environment is continuing to grow. Um, we have about 74,000 acres of urban land. That's uh, double what it was in the 70s. Um, so we're increasing that amount of impervious surfaces as we build and expand. Um, and there are sources of uh, contaminants and things that get into our lakes, um, and basically a, a healthy landscape equals healthy water. So um, unfortunately, I think uh, around 2010, uh, the Yohara Lakes were designated as, as impaired waterways uh, by the federal government under the Clean Water Act, um, and they're primary, they're impaired because of the nutrient uh, phosphorus. And so uh, you hear a lot about phosphorus. So what is phosphorus? Obviously, it's um, it's an element. Um, it's a it's vital to all life on the planet. Phosphorus goes through its own cycle through the environment, just like you hear the water cycle, the oxygen cycle, the carbon cycle. But of course, humans figured out a way to skew that cycle, um, and we uh, developed ways to mine rocks um, where phosphorus is naturally stored in the environment, and utilize that phosphorus in the form of fertilizer. Now, one thing that uh, 
to note about phosphorus is that uh, one pound of phosphorus can actually generate up to 500 pounds of algae. So this is actually um, what we call a limiting nutrient. The more phosphorus, the more algal growth, more plant growth in general. And this is actually a process called eutrophication. So that's the fancy word you can take home with you today if you haven't heard of it. Um, it summarizes exactly one of the, the biggest problems that we're seeing in the Yohar Lakes. Um, but not just in the Yohar Lakes, it's, it's around the world. If, if you've heard of uh, the red tides in Florida, um, it's the exact same problem. It's an excessive phosphorus inputs um, that allows plant growth to, to grow out of control. So, what was that picture? What's that? One of those water bodies there. The difference between a, a high nutrients and no nutrients. But these are where I'm, I'm not sure where this is actually. It's a great question. It's a research problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I believe um, I believe the source is you know it's, it's yeah it looks like everything's I yeah. Uh, but you can tell the difference between a, a eutrophic water body right next to um, a mesotrophic where there's not as many nutrients. Um, and it's important to, to note that like many things, problems flow downhill. Um, you know, we have sources of uh, this phosphorus um, throughout our watershed in the agricultural environment, as well as the urban environment. Um, and one of the things that I think is important to note uh, while we're down here in Stoughton, um, at the bottom of the watershed, is that um, the majority of the phosphorus um, comes from the upstream lakes. So. Lake Higanza receives 76% uh, of its surface water phosphorus load from Lake Lubisa. Lake Lubisa receives 80% of its phosphorus from Lake Monona. Uh, Monona receives 60%, um, which is a little less because it has a, a larger watershed flowing into it. Um, but these problems accumulate as you go downstream, which is why all the projects that Amy was talking about are up in the, the northern part of our watershed. That's where we can target and make the biggest difference. Things really do accumulate in, in our lakes. Pictures of bacteria, cyanobacteria. So this is blue-green algae. Um, this is the result of that eutrophication. Uh, the more phosphorus, um, the more of these blooms we'll see. Cyanobacteria is uh, a fascinating organism. It's one of the oldest organisms uh, that we know of. Um, it's a photosynthetic bacteria. It's completely different to other types of algae, uh, but we know that it likes hot temperatures, it likes very calm water, so no wind, so that it can make, manage its buoyancy in the water and reproduce and grow and feed it. Um, and then there's that, uh, they like that, that phosphorus, like all living things. Um, when you have excess phosphorus, you have some bacteria. And so why, why do we care about this? So, um, Sand bacteria poses a number of different risks. Um, obviously, they're aesthetically um, unpleasant to look at. They detract from the beauty of these uh, waterways. Um, Sand bacteria has the potential, or some species, I, mean, I should say, have the potential to produce toxins. They don't always produce toxins, but they can. So it's safe to assume that you should always um, be aware of this, um, and this is a significant public health risk. Microcystins is the toxin that's produced uh, commonly in these waters, um, and that can affect uh, the central nervous system and uh, cause seizures. It can, um, it's a, a threat to our, our pets and animals that can't tell the difference between uh, water that's safe to drink and water that's not. Cyanobacteria can decompose, and so when you the reason it gets its name blue-green algae is because when it decomposes, it releases its pigments. And you get these vibrant colors of white, blue, and even turquoise. Uh, this decomposition consumes oxygen. And oxygen, obviously, is important for all life, um, even in the aquatic, aquatic environment. Um, and it can create hypoxic zones and, and kill fish and kill wildlife. Uh, cyanobacteria in Algae blooms in general can block sunlight, so this reduces photosynthesis. Um, it uh, competes with other desirable uh, phytoplankton species. So 
Cyanobacteria kind of sits outside the food web in a sense. It's not really contributing to the diversity of the ecosystem. Very few things consume it. Um, there are very few zooplankton species that utilize it. Um, things like zebra mussels completely ignore it, which is unfortunate. Um, so it kind of sits by itself and outcompetes other desirable things and it affects zooplankton like Daphnia that Amy mentioned that is such an integral part of the food web. Um, so it's disruptive. Uh, again, it, it has the potential for, for fish kills and even uh, can affect wildlife. Um, but the toughest pill to swallow of all, is, all of this is that it makes these water resources that we love and cherish completely inaccessible. Um, you can't use this water safely. You can't get out on a stand-up paddleboard. You can't canoe, you can't swim, you can't fish in it well. Um, I'm an avid fisherman and I, no one wants to send lures into this water and fish, eat fish out of these. Um, so it's a really important challenge and obstacle to overcome. All of these pictures were from last year. These were sent in by uh, citizen monitors of uh, Lakes Lakes Alliance. And I've got hundreds of algae pictures if you want to see them. This is all from the uh, Yahara Watershed. Yes, most of these are uh, Mendota. And, um, happened throughout the year. We had a particular bad bloom uh, a couple in June. I remember we had uh, closed um, almost every public beach across all the lakes were closed for, for a period of time. Um, and then we got hit with uh, historic rainfall, so it was quite a challenging time for the lakes. Um, here's a, a cartoon. This is kind of the, the image that's kind of being generated over the past few the idea of um, water skiing in a hazmat suit. This is uh, a future that we want to avoid um, and, and we want to improve this image and protect our waterways. So we kind of have a choice to make as a community. Um, we, do we want uh, this bottom? We want this bottom picture. When you fly into Madison, you see our lakes um, and the beauty that they possess as opposed to um, excessive nutrients um, entering the waterways. And um, Clean Lakes Alliance is attempting to do that. It's attempting to build a community of people. So this is a, a, a map of all of the uh, last year's uh, donors to Clean Lakes Alliance and some of our members. Um, it also includes our board members. We have uh, over 100 board members on different committees that help guide our organization. We have DNR scientists, uh, engineers, business uh, leaders, and members of the community all gathered together uh, and discuss the future of our watershed. Um, I think it's important to note that um, it's not just uh, lakeshore property owners. They're not, they're not the only people that care about this. And this is really uh, a community problem that's important to all of us. So what are some things you can do as an individual? Um, I think uh, it, it's really easy to get overwhelmed by the scale and complexity of these problems. Um, it's, it's easy to become apathetic and frustrated, but I think it's important to know that there are actions that you can take as an individual and they can have a cumulative impact um, on the and complement the amazing work that the County Conservation Land Department is doing in the northern part of the watershed. So, uh, the primary contributor of phosphorus in the urban environment is, is leaves. So when leaves fall or rain on our impervious surfaces, they decompose. When water washes through, it creates a tea bag effect. You can actually see the color of the water changing as it flows through these piles of leaves and leaches phosphorus from them. And it goes directly into our stormwater system, which outlets and daylights directly into our lake. So making an effort to remove um, leaves from the street is incredibly important as a homeowner. Um, City of Madison is taking uh, extra strides to improve their leaf pickup strategies to uh, get these leaves out of the street where they can, uh, that phosphorus can enter the ground and be consumed by the plants uh, instead of flowing into the lakes to be consumed by algae. Yeah. And city ordinances that you break 
and, and that's new developments. People just weren't aware of that even five years ago. I mean, no one just sweep, sweep it into the street and the city comes and picks it up. That was the process. So we're, we're learning. Um, you can treat your property as a, uh, a kind of a mini watershed. Uh, this is an example of a rain garden. Um, you see these pop up more and more in residential neighborhoods. Um, this is an effective way to keep water on your property, infiltrating into the ground. Things like rain barrels are another example. Um, and again, I know it can, it can kind of seem like a drop in the bucket, but there, there will be cumulative benefits uh, as people adopt these strategies. You know, people in Arizona have to uh, tailor their landscape to a lack of water. We have to tailor it to an excessive amount of water. Um, I highly encourage you to volunteer. Um, there's uh, no better way to help them and get uh, hands-on experience um, restoring areas of in the near shore environment and um, in the prairie lands of, of our watershed. Um, cleaning beach cleanups, beach rakings. Um, there are a number of amazing organizations. You know, I'm not saying just volunteer with Clean Lakes Alliance. There's dozens of tremendous organizations. San Luis Obispo is one easy example here. Um, City of Madison Parks Department, Dane County Parks Department have cleanup and restoration efforts throughout the summer. There's entire uh, volunteer-led friends organizations that focus on particular areas and understand what's going on uh, at their site, Wild Warner at Warner Park. Uh, friends of Pheasant Branch Conservancy at the headwaters of Mendota are doing tremendous work to uh, remove invasive species and make our ecosystem more diverse so that it can handle that water as, as water becomes more frequent and excessive. Uh, Lake Forecast Outdoor is a Clean Lakes Alliance program that I'm particularly proud of. This is, um, you know, I, I actually started volunteering with this program before uh, now working full time with Clean Lakes Alliance. Uh, we have over 70 volunteer monitors around all five of our lakes that take, uh, that report conditions uh, throughout the summer. They measure clarity using a turbidity tube that takes temperature. Um, they are also trained to distinguish between uh, green algae and the blue green algae inside the bacteria that can tell the difference. And report that to this website um, so that people have real-time information about where these blooms are happening. Um, sometimes it's uh, unfortunate that all of these thumbs, all these public beaches have the red thumbs down, but you can see that process happening as our monitors start to report the blooms happening. I would be remiss if I didn't tell you to attend the Clean Lakes Alliance event. Um, I have to promote those. Um, we have a community breakfast coming up on May 8th um, at the Alliance Energy Center. We have it every year. Um, it brings together 800, 800 plus people to listen to some amazing speakers to hear about the state of the lakes, uh, what progress is being made in diverting phosphorus and improving this, this, uh, this watershed. But ultimately, uh, I just want to part this notion that uh, it's worthwhile to commit to action. It's worthwhile to, um, to learn and educate yourself by coming to events like this and taking a step farther and uh, breaking those leaves out of your yard and volunteering um, and being an engaged citizen because it's going to take a community effort. Um, it's not going to be just the farmers to be able to fix this problem. It's not. Um, it's, it's everybody. It's everybody in this watershed. So, um, ultimately, these lakes are ours. Uh, almost 50% of the lakeshore property and land use is publicly owned. It's not just residential properties. It's not commercial real estate. It's publicly owned land. It's green space. It's parks. It's land that's available for the public to use. Um, so again, it's just highlights how important this is to our community. Um, and uh, to finish up, uh, I, I have some State of the Lakes reports. This is our Clean Lakes Alliance's annual report that we publish every year. 
Um, I have 2017. We're uh, hard at work on 2018. Um, I was making maps all morning for it today. Um, that will be released um, at the community breakfast for everyone to see. And that really does an amazing job in summarizing the work that not only the work that Clean Lakes Alliance does, but also the work that's happening throughout the watershed um, to divert phosphorus um, and improve water quality in our lakes. Thank you. Different from a dead zone? You no, know, they just kill could it be from a spill or something, whereas a dead zone thing just I, I'm, I'm can't talking, sustain life. Absolutely, okay. yeah. I'm talking about fish kills related to that dead zone, like that, you know, the consumption of that oxygen, the eutrophication. That's, that's the, the cause of these fish kills in some situations. Um, Fish are affected by a variety of different you know, things. Uh, the koi herpes virus wiped out thousands of carp last year, but it's not as much a problem. <laughs> that increased the nutrient flow yeah. then the lakes too. Yeah, <laughs> they all died. Yeah. Any other uh, pressing questions for Luke before we switch over to our last uh, presenter, Susan? If not, uh, Susan, do you want to step up and uh, give us a little uh, update on invasive species and the lake systems? So this is Susan Graham from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, and I'm sure you do many things, but one of them is monitor invasive species and uh, how they're infecting or uh, could be affecting the area. Right. Thank you, Roger. Yes, um, you're welcome. I, um, I work on aquatic plants, um, grants to um, nonprofits and um, governmental organizations like cities and counties and towns. Um, I also work on aquatic invasive species, or AIS. It's a beloved acronym um, that we use a lot. Um, I'll probably use it without even realizing I'm doing it. Um, let's see. Here we go. Um, I am going to talk about um, just a very brief and quick background um, about aquatic invasive species. I'm going to talk about some example species that we have. Um, in Wisconsin, and then we're going to talk about um, things that you can do to help. Um, so a lot of times, you know, you hear a lot of things that governments are doing, or you know, here's the problem and the problem and the problem, without really a lot of answers on what you can do. Although I have to say that you did a great job talking about some things you can do for um, water quality. Um, so AIS 101, um, just some real fundamentals. Um, Aquatic invasive species um, can be plants, they can be animals, they can be pathogens. Um, among the animals, they can be um, vertebrates, they can be invertebrates, um, they can be fish. Um, sometimes they're, you know, a, you know, just all different classes of animals that could be invasive. Um, everything that comes from somewhere else isn't uh, poised to um, take hold and become a real problem. Those would, we would just call those um, non-natives, but some of the non-natives um, will find um, ideal conditions to really become a problem, either economic or ecological problem. Um, and there, you know, things from elsewhere can become really successful because the successful ones will tend to um, uh, be very aggressive. They can be uh, really good at reproducing. Um, they're prolific. Um, and then they can outcompete the native organisms, and they don't have anything that's a natural predator, um, so they they may be not uh, as uh, controllable as something that is um, adapted to our location here. So where do they come from? Um, this uh, photograph of a big uh, ship um, releasing its ballast water is the number one way that new things are coming into the aquatic environment or had in the past. Um, so the ballast water um, from ocean-going um, ships um, has been one of the worst um, uh, sources. Um, there's um, migration up the um, canals that aren't controlled. Um, we have nursery industries that are selling things. You can go online, you can buy just about anything anywhere in the world. Um, we can only prohibit what you possess here, but we 
don't really have any way to enforce um, you know, prohibitions against people buying things online or people selling things. Um, and then uh, another one would be um, anglers. Uh, people who are fishing, who love our waters, um, have inadvertently brought in some of the invasive species that we deal with. Um, and with through education and um, uh, other modes like that, we're trying to tackle um, that particular source. Um, aquaculture is uh, where people are rearing fish, uh, people move fish around a lot. Um, that's kind of like back in the 1940s, aquaculture was responsible for distribution of carp all over the state of Wisconsin and the Department of Natural Resources was the biggest offender. We were stocking carp in different places because at the time that was culturally um, not only accepted but promoted. Um, it was a good food source for, for people. Um, and then aquarium trades, right? You can go to stores um, or order online all kinds of aquatic animals for your aquarium. Uh, it, it gets it into the state and then people don't know that you weren't supposed to you know, kindly release your pets out back into the wild. And this isn't their wild. Um, so, you know, th th those are some places where they come from. And then how do they spread? Well, humans are the number one um, vector for how things move around. The, the most um, common way for aquatic invasive species to move is through boats. And so a lot of DNR's effort has been focusing on how do we stop that route um, uh, from, from boats. And you can see the photograph driving, uh, the trailer is accidentally driving plants out of the lake. Um, the plants um, aren't only a problem in and of themselves, but they can have invasive species attached to them, like zebra mussels, or um, an exotic algae could be attached to those plants. And then people drive to another lake launch that boat, and it, there you just introduced invasive species into the new lake. So that's just a, a major way. Um, uh, anglers are moving between um, lakes the same way. Um, scuba divers, we've got some water bodies that um, got zebra mussels, and the only use of the water body is divers. And so we are pretty darn sure that came in on equipment, like zebra mussels got into a lake, um, carried on equipment. Um, so these are some of the vectors. Um, why do we care? It's not just money. Um, it also impacts our recreation and it impacts our ecology um, of, you know, lakes, wetlands, streams. Um, so, you know, sometimes when something comes in and it, it takes hold and it, it flourishes, there is no way to eradicate. Um, you can try to control them in some cases. Um, eradication almost never can happen um, just because it just doesn't, we don't really have good methods. Um, but it also affects <coughs> how we use and enjoy our waters. Um, it affects our boating, like the uh, picture of the kayak in the bottom being stopped by a, a big, big bed of flowering rush. That's an invasive species in Wisconsin. And um, you can see the plants hanging off of the kayak paddles on the top, making paddling really difficult. That's in Pheasant Branch Creek. Um, just north of uh, Lake Mendota. So I just really want to make the strong point that not all plants are bad. Sometimes we talk about invasives and we say how bad and bad and bad all the plants are, but a lot of them are, are native here. Um, they belong here and they're actually necessary to healthy waters. Um, the photograph um, on the slide is um, a picture of water celery. This is the most common um, species of aquatic plant that grows in the Ohio River. And there's, in, at times and places, a lot of it. And late in the summer, it has an auto-release mechanism where the roots will let go out of the sediment and it floats downstream. And there can be a lot of it in, in, in the water. Um, it's uh, one of the best, most delicious sought after foods by recreational groups. <coughs> probably uh, responsible for the success of migratory birds in a lot of cases. And there used to be a lot more wild celery than there is now, but um, it's a pretty neat plant. Um, just wanted to bring that up because it's so common in the Ohio River. And um, uh, speaking of the river, um, and we were talking about um, you know climate change and high water events, um, Dane County is uh, working really hard on 
um, trying to figure out ways to reduce the amount of water that gets to the lakes and then increase the amount that gets out of the lakes. And one of those ways is by uh, harvesting the plants in the river where there are pinch points. The, the wa water celery grows so thick in the river in late summer that it literally slows the flow of the water. Um, USGS has done some modeling to prove that because it sounds a little bit unlikely, but it's true. Um, you can see the um, harvester has, you can see that water celery is sort of a, a long, narrow, smooth tape. In fact, another name for it is tape grass. Um, so this was taken in the river some years ago. And uh, removing those plants should help um, move the, the water volume out of the system. So you'll be hearing more about that as, um, as you know, the Dane County works on the, the water flow to reduce flooding. So getting on back to some invasive species, this is a really common one. You probably have heard about Eurasian water milfoil. Um, it dates back to the 60s in Wisconsin. Um, it's from Eurasia. Um, it is a prolific and early um, growing plant in the lakes. Um, it interferes with the boating, water skiing, it interferes with fishing. I mean, you can't even cast a line when it gets this thick. Um, so um, it, it also affects water chemistry. It affects how fast fish grow. Um, the plants can grow so thick that the fish can't, um, like predator fish can't get at, the, their, uh, at their prey. Um, and that you can literally um, improve fish growth by um, removing um, like long narrow lanes to create a lot of edge effect in these kind of thick, you know, big thick beds. Um, and they can measure that the, the fish will actually um, grow healthier and faster. Um, if they can get some open areas where there's too much of this stuff. It grows from fragments. Um, and um, I also, you can see some of the fragments, if, if you're able to see this bottom picture, the little fragments will break off and then roots will come off of the stems. And then that plant will find an open spot, it'll sink to the bottom, and it will take root and create a whole new colony. Um, so that's one of its main mechanisms of um, expansion. And I wanted to mention that um, a lot of invasive species have other things that look a lot like it. So we have um, a leaflet of Eurasian watermelon foil on the left, and a leaflet of the native um, beneficial coontail on the right. And you can see that, that these look, this is milk oil, and you can see how similar that looks to the coontail to the unpracticed eye. But if you look closely, you'll see that the leaf of milk oil has a long stem like a, a tree with side branches that come off. And the coontail is more like a fan. So they have a different structure and they're easy to tell apart when you know the clues to look for. Um, um, milfoil is commonly found in southern Wisconsin. It's in most lakes, not every lake. Uh, for some reason, it's not in Kashkanam. has never been documented there, um, which is kind of puzzling. Um, but check marks are in some of the, the streams where it's been um, documented. Curly leaf pondweed is another common one. This one has a leaf that um, looks a lot like a lasagna noodle. Um, with kind of a wavy edge and a serrated edge. Um, this has been here longer than Eurasian water milfoil, but it's um, really common. You can see all the spots where it's documented in southern Wisconsin. Zebra mussels, most of us have probably heard of zebra mussels. Um, these uh, little bivalve clams, um, about the size of your pinky fingernail, um, can attach to any firm substrate, any kind of a rock, native clams, which, which then get killed. They can hold on to the stems of plants and get dragged from lake to lake on trailers if they're not cleaned up. Um, you can see the picture of the zebra mussels with their characteristic zebra stripes. Um, these guys are prolific. Um, they got into Lake Mendota um, a number of years ago, and they're obviously spread downstream. Um, they're probably going by the river as we speak. Um, I don't really know how prolific or how abundant they'll become in the river, um, but this is something that would be of concern for people who are recreating in the river, uh, perhaps barefoot. Um, these will cut your feet. Um, in some water bodies, or especially like lakes where they become abundant, people just learn you've got to wear water shoes. 
and you know, you, I got a phone call a couple years ago from Lake Kashkanon, who um, had a, kind of some, you know, abundant zebra mussels were starting to show up on piers, and a, a neighborhood group were taking piers out at the end, and they called me to complain. Our hands were getting all cut up on the piers. What's going on with these zebra mussels? And I said, they're here. They're here to stay. Buy leather gloves and just start wearing leather gloves on your work day. Because, um, you know, there's, they're, they're very sharp and they will affect recreation. Um, this map shows the water bodies that they're currently in. Um, they got into Rock Lake. Uh, I think it was the first lake uh, that they showed up in here some years ago. And then they went downstream and then down in Kashkanon. They're not super abundant there, I don't think, but they got into the Dota. They are spreading down, you know, have spread downstream. They got into Fox Lake and they spread down to Beaver Dam, and then they're in the Wisconsin, or, uh, Lake Wisconsin. So those are the lakes in our area that have zebra mussels. Um, another animal that filters, or sorry, I should say that this is another small animal that. Um, lives um, just in the Madison lakes in our area. Um, no other lakes down here have it. Is the spiny and um, fish hook water fleas. These are a plankton that have a long, hard, sharp, uh, barb, you know, barbed tail. It's not really 100% barbed. You can see little barbs on it, but it sticks in the throats of sunfish. So they're not very yummy for sunfish to eat. But at the same time, um, that they will eat um, smaller or like other plankton that eat algae. So there's more algae. In, in fact, they they have uh, measured um, a water clarity reduction in Lake Mendota of a meter since these um, animals have showed up in, in Lake Mendota. So there's literal um, economic uh, detriment to this species showing up because the water is not so clear. People, you know, on average are going to spend less money and spend less time uh, recreating on a water that has more algae in it um, than, than before. They also impact um, anglers. Um, because even though swimming, you're not going to see or feel or notice them, but anglers, uh, this is the tip of a fishing pole and this is the line. They will cluster and like clump up on the line. They're a little bit sticky and um, they'll make a clump, and then the fish can see the line. So we think that the fish might not um, be as willing um, to bite on a hook at the end of a line that they can see. Um, so there, there is some impact to um, anglers also. This is just a picture of the Madison Lakes. It's the only lakes in the south that have spiny water flea that we know of. Uh, we are sampling for them to find out because we want to make sure that if a new lake were to get spiny <coughs> water flea, that we just get the word out and it just sort of uh, reinvigorates um, local people's efforts to um, teach people to clean off their boats and make sure that they aren't um, moving water from uh, lake to lake um, that would spread the spiny water flea. Uh, this illustration um, just tries to maybe just capture what happens when you get these spiny water fleas is you're, you're going to have um, an effect on the food web that would result in more algae. We have zebra mussels, they filter water and they also affect the food web. Um, they transfer nutrients from where they would reside in the, um, in the fish bodies, in the plant um, material, in the bottom of the lake. So they, they just affect the nutrients and they wouldn't theoretically end up having less algae, so the water would be more clear. And people sometimes see that and say, hey, we should get zebra mussels, ha ha. You know, the water's going to get clear. And it's like it almost seems like it might make sense, but uh, the, the state of Michigan has done studies and found that when they have zebra mussels, they actually get more blue-green algae at different times than a lake before they got zebra mussels. And that's because the zebra mussels are selective feeders. They'll suck out algae from down where they're living. And more of the blue-greens, which float at the surface um, by choice, because they can choose where they float. They tend to float at the surface. Then those can flourish and grow in their, their competition from other algae are not there. So these invasive species do affect water quality. 
um, among other things. They also affect just the direct um, impact um, ecologically. The VHS, uh, or viral hemorrhagic septicemia, is a uh, pretty well-known um, and uh, pretty well-studied uh, virus for fish. It, it's not selective. It kills at least 25 different species of uh, fish in our lakes. And um, we don't really have VHS around here. It's mainly like in um, the, the Great Lakes and the Lake Winnebago lakes. Um, and we think it's spread by infected fish, but it also can be moved by water. So this species of, or this virus, this invasive species was uh, responsible for um, one of the laws that says you cannot take water from a, a lake or a, any water body to any other water body. You're not allowed to take bait and reuse it at a different lake um, because there could be or transfer of water. You can't take your fish home alive. You got to put them on ice to take your catch home. Um, so we're trying to get the word out about those, um, about the rules, or about the laws that people need to follow. Um, so Japanese knotweed. Um, Japanese knotweed is considered an aquatic plant in a way is that sometimes it likes to grow next to water. It'll grow on the banks of a Bad Fish Creek, for example, or next to the banks of a lake, um, or in ditches or wetlands, and it does really, really well in those settings. Um, it also can spread by water. Like there's a, a place over in uh, Crawford County where um, somebody that worked in horticulture planted a, pa a patch of Japanese knotweed outside their home, and we had some flooding back in probably 2010, um, and the pieces of the root went downhill and it followed a ravine for two miles down to the Mississippi River and all up and down that ravine are patches of knotweed. It, it's an enormous um, uh, flooding risk because other plants that are going to follow that water course, they'll catch, plant fragments will catch in, in those um, stems, they grow really thick together, and it can create localized flooding. Um, costing millions of dollars that happened in New Jersey, if you want to Google it, it's kind of interesting. Um, so it spreads via water, um, it spreads via clonal growth of um, the roots um, under the soil, and it's something that if it's growing near water, we're really, really interested in knowing about it. So if people could please um, let me know if you know of any that is growing in a ditch, a drainage way, or next to water, um, we're, we have a map that we are just continually adding to the map. And then we also provide funding, a cost share funding, to um, eligible uh, sponsors to help pay for the control of this. I'm working on developing a grant like that right now for City of Madison, where they've identified all the wet areas that have not be growing next to them, and then we're going to provide um, some cost share funding to help pay for the control of, uh, of this species. Asian clams, we don't have these near here yet. Um, they are over in Waukesha County. Um, these little clams are kind of cute. Um, if you run your fingernail down these ridges, it sounds like a comb, you know, brrr, like that. You can feel and hear those ridges. Um, these are spreading around the country and spreading around the state, and we're trying to slow that down. Um, we're not sure exactly what impact they're going to have, but they will be. Uh, certainly competing with other uh, filter feeders in, um, in streams. So what can you do? Uh, know and follow the law. That's the first thing. It's, it's just kind of like know what it is that you're supposed to do. You can, you know, you've got friends or family coming to town, you can share this information with them. Um, you know, go out for, on a lake or go out paddling with some friends, you can share it with them. Um, so the, the, the law is basically that you cannot um, transport boats on a roadway with any known attached um, or organisms. Like you've got to clean all the plants off your trailer before you leave the boat launch or you're breaking the law. And another one is that you've got to um, drain your water. Drain your live wells, um, take the water out of your bait, um, throw away your bait. You have to put your fish on ice if you caught any fish. Um, don't bring your fish home in a bucket of water. Uh, or you would be possibly subject to citation. 
Um, this big black and red and white signs are, uh, our goal is to have one of these signs to remind people of the law at every single boat launch on a lake in the state. And we're getting close. Uh, there's a lot of them out there. Of course, they need constant maintenance because they're uh, often used for target practice. They get old. They get run over by someone who doesn't know how to drive a truck. Um, I don't know. <laughs> they, they, they do require maintenance, but that's our goal. And we're even getting a, a lot of them out on um, stream boat landings also, the more heavily used um, boat landings. Um, the map just shows um, how important boats are as vectors. You can see all the different places that have come to Lake Mendota in one year. This is, I think, data from 2016. And you can see how many different um, places people could be bringing invasives um, just to one lake. Um, kind of a neat database that can tell us this. Um, but that really tells us that Lake Mendota is a really high-risk lake for spreading to other places because it's been exposed to so many other lakes and uh, people uh, may not always be cleaning off their boats. Um, and so the transport laws are like, in a nutshell, inspect your trailers, uh, remove anything that you find, drain all the water, and never move live fish away from a water body. Ice your catch instead. Um, we want people to dispose of unwanted bait in the trash and buy your minnows from a Wisconsin bait dealer. Don't Get them from a friend of a friend who has a friend. It's um, that's not legal. Um, and then the last thing is to keep your eyes open. You guys are the people who are out here caring about our resource. You know what you're used to seeing, and if you see something weird, take a picture. Go to the DNR website, dnr.wi.gov, and you can search any of these terms: invasives, report on AIS or AIS reporting. And this page will come up. And it tells you exactly what you should do. If, if it's a plant, sorry, you can't read this very well. Um, it'll, it gives you the instructions of what to do. If it's a plant, if it's an animal, or if it's a fish. I mean, I don't, it says if it's an animal, not fish, or just an animal. And it tells you what to do. We'd like you to take a close-up photo, collect a specimen, and contact the DNR. If, um, if you want to send it to us an email, that's perfect. Um, we don't need to run all over the state to look at things. Send us a picture, we'll look at it and say, is this something to worry about or not? This is a, maybe this is coontail, or maybe it is no foil in a new lake, and we need to know that. Um, the earlier we can know about invasives, um, the higher the likelihood that we can do something about it. Um, so, our, in, you know, we have a pretty good database. If we say, yes, this is something to worry about, there's a short, like a one-page form that we ask you to fill out. This just says, who are you? What's your phone number? Um, wh where did you find this organism? And then the DNR fills out, you know, was this verified to be um, a species of concern? Um, and then once we know where things are, we can try to get um, control information, like how do you control it, if anything? Um, is there funding available to help pay for control? Um, we're helping, uh, happy to help try to f facilitate some kind of constructive action. So that's all I have about invasive species. I appreciate your time and attention. And um, anybody has any quick questions for me, or should I just jump up to the Yeah, I think it's for anybody panel? else. Wide open uh, questions for uh, Susan or the other two speakers. So go ahead, just take as you need. I was wondering about the manure digesters, how they're working out when they first started came on lines to be an awful lot of problems with them. Um, I mean, they're, they're working. Mm -hmm. I think um, there was some um, concerns early on just some growing pains and things like that, you know, new, new system, um, and some of them have had transitions in ownership, so there's some new business models and things that are going on. But right now they're, they're functioning and the county is looking at exploring um, more options for additional digesters. Over there, far side. What, um, uh, what effect does, uh, obviously we use a lot of salt around here, what, what effect does that have on the waterways? Uh, yeah, so uh, nothing really uses salt. So there's no or organic matter that needs salt to uh, reproduce, so it accumulates. Um, and 
it tends to accumulate um, at the bottom of the, of the lakes, and uh, if it reaches a high enough concentration, it could affect um, the fish and the, the species that live there, and potentially um, disrupt that food web. Um, we haven't seen it um, in the concentrations that uh, could produce fish kills. Um, it does. Um, it does move through the water, the, the watershed, um, but if it does reach high enough concentrations, it can be absolutely continue to be a problem. I saw a hand up over. Oh, I have a uh, question about the knotweed. So we have a lot of knotweed on the Yahara south of, of Stoughton. Mm -hmm. um, any recommendations as far as management of that? How do you control it? Yeah, we had it in our back in our backyard, and we still have it sprouting right. even after years of yeah. cutting and herbiciding right. and stuff. Japanese knotweed is notoriously difficult to kill. Um, I know of a house uh, north of Lake Mendota, right near the water, that has it, and they didn't want to use chemicals. They put a black tarp over it. That black tarp is still there like 10 years later, and it, it presumably because it's still sprouting. So herbicide really is, I, in my opinion, is essential um, unless somebody has the time and energy to like dig six feet down and remove every fragment <laughs> of the root, uh, which nobody can really effectively do. I mean, if this patch is very big or old, you can't do that. So um, it's... Uh, yeah, it's really hard, but there are you know specific herbicides at specific times, and we have information that if you want that information, I can give you the details um, so that you know we can be accurate and you can do something that's effective. It's a it's a hard one. Yeah. I mean, even um, by the dam here, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's quite a big stand of it. Yeah, and it. I mean, in other countries, they won't even give um, insurance, homeowners insurance, yeah. if it's in the area. Yeah. So how, you know, and we just replaced it, you know, or did work on the dam, and yet there's a huge amount of it right there. Right. And I don't even know if the city's doing any of anything with it. You're talking about the Dunkirk Dam? Uh, no, I'm talking no, about the right Stoughton Dam. Oh, Stoughton. It's a, there's a huge patch of it by the Stoughton Dam. That whole park is full of, where, where the water, um, white water park is going, yeah. that's all not me. And also down Fourth Street. Fourth Street? On the, on the riverside of the. Okay. Yeah, the and, and, and all the way down Fourth Street and Taylor Lane, and, and, and it's all the way down Pedestrian Bridge, all the way Street, all the way down Fourth Street Bridge. Sure. Sounds like we get plenty of it to yeah. manage. Right. This city would be an eligible entity to get cost share funding from the DNR, um, if, it, it, especially if it's not like a really old patch. Like we are still <coughs> targeting new infestations with that funding. So anything that's less than five years old is something that's fundable. So if the city wants to contact us, we are happy to be partners with them. And then it takes about five years or more to do the control. Um, we're not even really sure how long it takes, um, but it's at least five years and then vigilant monitoring, make sure nothing sprouts from those pots. And I've seen it being mowed and then you have all those fragments and then the fragments yeah. Too. So, yeah, it's, there's a big issue here at the time. Mm -hmm. School district also has land, Cooper's Way. Yeah, it was the there, there too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we had a question over here. Uh, somebody? Oh, I was, it was about the time. No, that's okay. <laughs> Other questions for our presenters? Just in general, what's the status on the uh, Whitewater Park? Well, Dan, uh, Dan, do you want to <laughs> mention that while you're here? Sure, so the, the next thing we're doing is we're going to have the sediment sample in the river. And um, the other, the other once that it's done, when the next step would be doing a hydraulic and hydrological study. And that really studied the flow and the water level from the river and how that would be impacted by the white water park. Is it basically a goal? Um, I think there's some, these, I think these, Things that we're doing are going to answer some questions if we should do it or not. But I don't know if we could maybe answer that. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I guess the feeling right now is that it would be a go unless the sediment sampling comes up something that is unexpected, or if it's unexpected and we can't remediate it in a cost effective manner, then I think it would be up for discussion. 
And also, I mean, right now we're talking about whether the dam will be left in or taken out. And with right now, we don't know what the county has to say with that with respect to all the water events last year. And so last year really kind of threw a lot of things at us that we, you know, now are trying to juggle through. But I believe everything will, you know, I'm optimistic that the sediments and plane will be something that we can deal with. And then the hydrologic study will be uh, good that we can you know, present it to the community and make a really collective decision. Five year or 10 year time frame? Uh, we're hoping like five years. A lot, yeah, I'd say less than five years. Mm -hmm. Everything comes back up. Well, I have a question since uh, I use my prerogative as the uh, host to kind of ask the uh, panelists some questions. I guess my key question is that through most of Stoughton, the river, of course, is a river and is actively flowing, moving at a maybe a notch or a knot and a half, whatever it happens to be, given the amount of water down the river. So, from your perspectives, as you view the river as it flows through downtown Stoughton, what water quality or invasive species issues, now that you know about the Natalie, uh, should we be most concerned about with respect to having a very active, we hope, uh, future for the river? Uh, we're going to have hundreds of new people hopefully living on it over the next couple of years, perhaps thousands every summer if things go well with the Whitewater Park actually using the river. What water quality things would you have us think about here in Stoke to keep, keep the river healthy? Obviously, what happens upstream, we'd love to help you up there, and we will to the extent we can, but inside Stoughton, what is it we can do to make the river a more viable, a healthy place for us, at least down here? Things that we can do. Just anybody. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, it is all interconnected. The, the water in that river is coming directly right. from Lake Agonda. Yep. So uh, when you talk about uh, blue-green algae, I think that uh, one of the things in your favor is that um, algae prefers calm water. Right. It, it's not going to be uh, blooming and reproducing in, in the, the river if it's moving quickly. Now, that's not to say that um, blooms can happen in Lake Aganza and float uh, down river, but these blooms um, can be very short-lived. They can uh, reproduce very rapidly and be gone within hours. Um, so, And then another uh, important thing to consider is that you, you can see when the water could be unsafe. You know, you have visual cues to tell you this water has blue-green algae in it um, and it needs to be avoided. Um, and if you don't see it, then it's not there and it's typically safe to be in. Um, and that's what we tell people when they utilize public beaches throughout uh, the watershed and on all our lakes. Um, so I think that is uh, what you can consider um, a, Beneficial aspect of using moving water. Moving water, yeah, it's right. in your advantage for sure. I think from a municipality standpoint, you know, you're talking about the city of Stoughton and what you can do along that river corridor is um, managing what kind of corridor you want. Do you want, you know, manicured lawns up to the stream, or do you want native mm -hmm. um, plantings, things like that along along there? Sure. You know, that combination of you know, development and uh, impervious surfaces versus trying to encourage you know, more native or um, infiltration practices. So thinking about that as you look at right. that redevelopment, how does that fit into right. it? That is one thing we have thought of for the riverfront project, making sure we have uh, proper infiltration basins, uh, wetlands, kind of a mini wetland maybe right near the river. So anything flowing off the city property towards the river gets intercepted before it gets to the river. So we kind of thought about that. I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Are there are there any grants or anything available for pro individual property owners that may want to do something like that? Let's say somebody here has some property in the river. Where could they learn about what they could do to, let's say, create an infiltration basin at the point where their property is near the river? Is there something they can, any grants or assistance available or 
design know, assistance? I'm not sure about next to the river. There, there are grants for um, native gardens, um, you know, native plantings and buffer strips next to lakes okay. called Healthy Lakes Grants. I don't know about rivers. Um, but people can certainly do that kind of thing by, there's, you know, inexpensive and relatively easy ways to promote native plantings um, without spending a ton of money. Um, but the first thing really is probably to take um, quick and effective action against the knotweed because it doesn't only grow there for a long time, but it spreads. And it will continue to spread until that's all you have. And you can't have a native planting where you have knotweed because it's a monoculture. It'll just take over. Yeah, completely smother anything else that you want there. So that would be a good first step is to work on that. And that there's funding for it. Sounds like we need to hire a knotweed, knotweed specialist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The county also has um, what we call our planting program, which is the ability to purchase um, native plants at oh, a very okay. low cost. Cool. So they're available for... Is that year round or is that a certain uh, time of year? I think it closed in March, oh, so it's once right. a year, and then you pick up your plants. Wait, one day left. <laughs> I don't remember which date it closed, but then there's also the county hosts a number of rain garden, okay. you know, uh, workshops and things for homeowners. Okay. That well, sounds good too. Some things yeah. that people could. Is that on your to. website then? These other. Yeah, they're usually are posted on our website. Okay. With okay. Or maybe events. on the thing, Alliance one, or yeah, yeah, so. things like this posted on your website. Absolutely yes. Okay. So those are things. That Final you questions. Can. Okay, over here. Um, this is for Amy. Um, you mentioned in, in your talk about the RCPP, you know, the NRCS program. I know there was a program that yeah, was specific to the Ahara River. Could you kind of talk a little bit about that and any thoughts about that program maybe being readdressed and maybe Stoughton could get involved in that one? Um, RCPP stands, oh, stands for Resource Conservation Partnership Program. Yes. It is a NRCS, the, the federal program. If, Basically, it's a subset of their EQIP program. If you're at all familiar with NRCS programs and their acronyms, um, we had a grant that was a partnership through um, Yahara Winds. So Stoughton would have been part of that as far as Yahara Winds, MSD, municipalities. Um, <coughs> that primarily um, gave us a dedicated pot of EQIP funds, as NRCS calls them just for the Yahara, so we didn't necessarily have to compete in regional or statewide um, things. Uh, that program basically, we're in our last year, so we've allocated all of the funds. Whether or not we apply for another one, I guess, depends on whether or not um, we continue to offer that program, if the federal government continues to fund it. The, there's pros and cons to it. You know, one is it's, you know, you were able to uh, get quite a bit of money. Um, for that. Uh, it is a federal program, so we have less local control over how we implement it, um, and more sidebars on what we can and can't do. So there's pros and cons to it. Uh, I think we're evaluating what we do next, since that grant is ending. I think I saw a question in back, uh, somebody? Yeah. Um, do you guys have any thoughts around the idea of removing or not removing the dam? here in town? I mean, does that have an impact on water quality? Um, as my, I think um, I think you have to do a hydrological study, like you uh, were talking about earlier. I think um, because of the recent rainfall events, um, it kind of puts things in a new perspective of what we could expect in terms of the CFS, the flow that will be moving out of Lake Kaganza. Um, you know, as far as I know, the, that dam has been wide open for quite some time. Um, and I know that uh, Dane County just released a technical report um, on managing lake levels and um, the options. And they, they do document uh, and model outcomes of removing those dams. I can't remember. Uh, exactly the results, but um, I know their recommendation um, was more focused on, um, you know, improving the channels uh, of, and, and improving the flow of the, the 
channels and also decreasing leads in the channels to increase flow. Upstream. Was Upstream, it? yeah. Um, so I'm not sure what effect removing the dam would have. Um, removing dams, you have to be aware of sediment de deposition downstream and sediment moving more quickly. Um, but those things can be mitigated. Um, so I think you would have to do a proper hydrologic study to kind of see what effects that would have. Okay, other questions? Just, oh, one more. Go ahead. Yeah. All that rain we had, what effect does that have on algae? Does it, does it wash away? Is it less? Does it make it more? Uh, it, it, it makes it more. Uh, <laughs> it makes it a lot more. You weren't more. supposed to say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, rainfall is basically what drives uh, the phosphorus into the lakes. So um, the timing of that rainfall is very important. Um, you know, 50% of the phosphorus that enters the lake in an entire year uh, happens in uh, March and April, uh, where we have rainfall landing on frozen ground um, and washing things like manure uh, into the waterways. So. Excessive rain and the timing of that rain is, is very important and has a, a big part to do with how frequent these blooms happen. One thing I want to mention before I forget it, I had it in front of me here and I just almost forget it again because I don't look down enough at my own notes. Um, <laughs> last year I, for the first time, uh, decided to be a volunteer for the Rock River Coalition. And I was a citizen volunteer for water monitoring and I was given, I, has anybody else done this by the way? Great. So you know what I'm talking about. So you, was it for the Rock River uh, yeah, Coalition or some other? So what I'm explaining is what these gentlemen and others have done here is that you can actually get involved in water quality sampling and determination yourself by volunteering. I'm sure maybe with your group, Luke. Oh, absolutely. So you do water quality testing the way it sounds. We do that. Okay. And you also can do it through the Rock River Coalition, and they're going to be attending our Earth Day Expo. Uh, and, and by the way, if you folks want to attend and come there as a guest of ours, you're more than welcome to. But uh, if you really enjoy finding out what's in our water and know, want to know how the water works, that is, how it changes over time from season to season, if you get to get that interested in water quality sampling, the Rock River Coalition is doing some uh, training over the next month. So if you want to be a citizen volunteer, at least for the Rock River Group, and I'm sure for Luke's group as well, the Clean, uh, Clean Lakes Alliance. I'm guessing you do training there every so often? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And, and it's really a fun thing to do. You can measure dissolved oxygen. You can scoop up some critters in the bottom of a stream, kind of uh, put them in little sampling trays, find out what they are. Is, are those critters indicative of, of good water or are they indicative of bad water? And that, and that changes over time. So it's a really fun thing to do, and uh, if you haven't done it or thought about it, you can check with me or one of the other folks here that just raised their hand, or Luke, and join in and get involved and make a difference for our water quality. So if, if I think, unless there's something else that we want to do now, I think we're done. Let's give our presenters a hand. <laughs>